Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this press conference here at the 2018 Annual Meeting of the New Champions. My name is Amanda Russo. I'm one of the public engagement leads here at the World Economic Forum. And uh, oh, first, a bit of housekeeping for those watching on our webcast, hashtag AM. NC18 is what you'd like to use to interact with us on social media. But I have a very exciting 25 to 30 minutes planned for the people in the room here. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome John Hawksworth and James Chang from PwC. Uh, we're launching a very exciting report here at AMNC18. Uh, what will be the net impact of AI and related technologies on jobs in China? Very topical, very uh, exciting, and I know it's on the minds of many of the reporters here. And you probably don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from these guys here. So John, I'm going to introduce you. John Hawksworth is the chief economist specializing in global macroeconomics and public policy issues at PwC. He's the editor of PwC's global Global Economic Watch and World in 2050 reports and the, uh, and the author of the report we're going to be talking about today. Also is James Chang, he's here with us today, PwC China Financial Services Consulting Lead. He leads the team covering pretty much everything um, from a variety of professional solutions ranging from strategy, risk, finance, operations, IT, and fintech. So uh, thank you gentlemen. Uh, my first question will kick it off to you, John. Um, can you just tell us some key findings about the report? Yes, um, thanks very much. So I think there's a general acceptance that AI and related technologies, by which I mean things like robots, drones, driverless cars, you know, bring great benefits to the economy potentially, but there is concern about jobs. And I think one reason for this is that it's quite easy to see the kind of jobs that will be displaced. You know, if you have a driverless truck, that's going to displace a truck driver. But it's a little bit more difficult to conceptualize some of the jobs that will be created. Uh, of course, you could say there's a few jobs for experts in AI and experts in robotics, but beyond that, you know, it's difficult to come up with a large number of jobs that, uh, to match those that would be displaced. So what, it, what we tried to do in this study is to look at the broader macroeconomic benefits of um, AI and these other technologies in boosting economic growth and real incomes and work out how those could feed through into the broader economy and generate extra jobs. So a key effect, for example, is that these technologies will boost productivity, that will reduce costs, and will allow companies to reduce prices. So consumers then have more real incomes to spend on a variety of other goods and services, and to produce those other goods and services, you know, you'll need extra people to some degree. Uh, secondly, they will tend to boost the profits, and either the companies themselves or the shareholders will reinvest those pro profits in R&D and capital investment to generate new goods and services, which in turn will also create extra demand for people to actually help provide those. And so it, it's only by taking that broader macroeconomic perspective that you can fully see the positive job creation side of AI and these other technologies. Uh, and many of these jobs will be nothing to do with AI or robots. They will just be the result of having a richer society, more income, more spending, therefore more demand for labor. So how do we put concrete numbers on this? Well, I think firstly just the headlines from the study, which is that we think that in an earlier study for UK that we published in July, we think that the job displacement and job uh, creation will broadly balance each other. About 20% jobs displaced, 20% jobs created. In China, we think that the balance will be positive, with around 26% of jobs displaced over the next 20 years and about 38% uh, created. And as a result of that, we actually think there will be a, a positive net benefit of around 12% to employment in China over the next 20 years, which to put that in absolute numbers is about 90 million extra jobs. So it's a very significant number of extra jobs potentially as a result of these beneficial macroeconomic effects I've talked about. Um, now, if we look at where those jobs actually potentially come from, I think the biggest number will come from the services sector. And indeed, we see a net boost to services employment of around 97 million, you know, close to 30 percent. Uh, this will be particularly in areas like healthcare, um, technical and scientific services, information and communication services, education, where we see a large <coughs> increase in the demand of, for those sectors. I mean, in healthcare with the aging population in China, 
and also where we see that the human touch is still going to be needed, so you can't fully automate those things. Of course, there is room for automation and AI and robots to help in healthcare, but more as complements to human beings rather than totally replacing them. So we see a big job boost in services. We also see some job boost in construction, where we see a, a further a strong increase in demand in China as, uh, as urbanization continues and potentially a 200 odd million people more move to the cities over the next 30 or 40 years. And also as China, if you like, construction companies start to work overseas on infrastructure projects linked to the Belt and Road Initiative and that creates increased demand for labor there. I think offsetting that, we do see some decline in jobs in agriculture, continuing a long-standing trend as there's more automation there. And on manufacturing, we see a broadly balanced picture. On the one hand, there would be less jobs in some of the traditional low-value uh, areas where China used to compete on cost, but as China's wages have gone up, uh, increasingly some of those jobs in textiles, clothing, footwear are already going to places like uh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and so on. And China, I think, so there will be job losses there as there's more automation of those sectors in China, but there will be compensating job gains because we see China as becoming the world leader in producing the new robots, the new drones, the new driverless vehicles, and the other smart machines that will actually sort of power the fourth industrial revolution. And so we do see, therefore, in manufacturing, there will be a broad balance of job gains and job losses for that reason, but the nature of the jobs and the focus of those sectors in China will change. So overall, it is a very positive picture. Of course, there are many uncertainties around any such estimates. Um, and we've looked at a number of different scenarios in the report and a number of different assumptions. Um, but I think in general, we find that even in a more pessimistic scenario where AI has less impact and perhaps there's more job displacement, we're still likely to see you know, some kind of net positive effect, even if it's rather smaller than in our central estimates. So for China, I think we do see that the conclusion that there's some positive net benefit is relatively robust. Uh, that doesn't say there's room for complacency, because there will be huge disruption in this process. We are talking about potentially 200 million jobs displaced over the next 20 years and 290 million jobs created. So there will be need for huge career changes for many people, people moving between sectors and careers, people potentially moving between locations. Of course, China's already seen this over the last 40 years that people have moved in large numbers from the farms to the city. So this is nothing new in China. But I think there's a further process uh, going on there. And therefore, there's a need to, to invest in retraining in other areas. So there's no room for complacency, but overall our message is positive, not just in terms of the benefits for GDP, uh, but also in terms of the benefits for employment in China in the long run. Great. Everyone got all that? <laughs> John, thank you very much. Uh, James, if we could ask about the business and policy implications of this study, um, what, would you, what, what would your statement be? Yeah. Um, as John mentioned, um, AI brings both the, I guess, the positive impact as well as the negative impact. Now, we all know China has implemented this so-called next generation AI plan. Well, I created that plan. The key is right now to execution. How can China ex execute it in a good way where you could fully maximize the benefit but mitigate the harms? So let me talk about how do we ma maximize the benefit. Um, a lot of new jobs are going to come in from those areas where um, AI technology as well as AI design and the infrastructure all needs to be created and designed and deployed. So, for example, um, we all know China is still in a rapid urbanization stages. Um, we're talking about there's like hundreds, hundreds of small cities has been built around the countries. And we all know small city requires a lot of uh, so-called uh, smart principles. And that is basically using all the AI techniques, whether it's smart traffic control um, to reduce the congestions, smart energy grid to improve the energy consumptions and uh, reduce the pollutions, as well as uh, medical and healthcare, elderly care related, related um, fact um, uh, related areas. So this is certainly, there's a lot of uh, opportunities in that area, right? And the second areas where China should consider to maximize the benefit is the um, education process. 
um, we all know it's as, as the talent pool shifts towards those new skill sets, um, the, the, the college and education need to upgrade its curriculum. And we all know here, China, it's in, when it comes to the education, they're still very kind of traditional in the behind in those areas. So it would be very p beneficial for China to open that and connect internationally and really bring uh, some of the international academic experts in, into this area and create that connectivity and therefore benefit and upgrade the education system. Now, how do we minimize the, the harm? Um, as John mentioned, there's a lot of people going to lose the job, especially those that are very low end or middle level of technical skills. Um, at the, the, from policy perspective, you need to create a path which will help these people to retool their skill set, retrain their profession, and maybe add some social safety net to make sure when others getting the benefit and that those who's being impacted negatively, the negative in impact being reduced to the minimum. Therefore, we make sure you know, the overall, as John mentioned, the overall there's a net positive impact being shared equally. Because every time, think about it, you know, you look at every industrialization, there seems to be a more, um, I guess, a widening of the inequality in this whole society. This is not just in China, but globally. And uh, we want to make sure during this so-called forced industrialization or AI-driven uh, technology innovations, we make sure the whole society, globally, um, everyone gets the benefit and they share the benefits. Great, thank you. Um, I, one question before we open it up to the group. Um, obviously China is, is a global leader, is a global player. I'm assuming this data will have global impact and global repercussions. I don't know, can you guys comment on, on the wider impact? Yeah, well, shall I give a few remarks? Um, James can add to that. Um, so I think certainly, I mean, China is, I think, depending on how you measure it, the first or second largest uh, economy in the world, and certainly within the next tw 20 years, it will become the biggest economy in the world, according to our projections in this and other reports. So China has a huge impact. It's also a very open economy. It trades and invests a lot. And I think we can inc increasingly see that China's becoming the world leader in many of these technologies around mobile technology, AI, and other things. And I think... You know, because it has this huge domestic market, that it can then leverage that as a platform to then go global. Now, at the moment, the focus may be in China on trying to uh, make the most of the domestic market because it's so large and make the most of the huge pool of data which is available in China, which is absolutely critical for AI and machine learning models to have that huge pool of data. But that then gives a, a, a fantastic platform for China actually to become you know, an international leader as well. And as China gradually opens up, you know, in all sorts of ways, financially and otherwise. I was just at the session now talking about China's financial opening. As this opening continues, uh, then I think China will really have a, a major impact on global technological change and it will become the global leader in, in, in many of these technologies. And as I say, it will become the manufacturer of robots and other things exporting to the rest of the world. Uh, I think it's also worth just saying we have looked at some other countries. And, you know, I think for the UK, I think we see that job gains and job losses are more or less balanced. So whereas in China it's net positive, for the UK it's about 20% job losses, 20% job gains. And the UK, according to our other research, is fairly average across the OECD countries. So while it won't be true of every single OECD country, I think for the mature developed uh, countries in Western Europe, say, or possibly also the US, I think again we'd see a broadly balanced picture. So a lot of the net gains globally may actually come from China. China is actually the area where we're probably seeing the biggest gains because of this big market, because of the big government investment in AI, and because of the very strong education level in, in science, technology, maths, and other relevant subjects. Okay. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of points. Um, China should really take this opportunity in a, to transition itself used to be more like a create or copy to China or made it in China to now create it in China, being more innovative uh, through this AI. There's a reason I believe, uh, unlike the first couple um, 
I guess, um, industrialization where China was really behind both in terms of technology, capital, and the pe uh, talents. But in this stage of uh, industrialization, first of all, China has a lot of capital. But more importantly, from AI perspective, China has a lot of data, right? Because we all know AI is about data, algorithm, and the computation power. Everyone has the algorithm and the com computation power, but China has the most data. Because you know why? We have 1.4 uh, billion people, and it has the highest of what we call the 4G, um, and the soon to be 5G penetrations. Mm -hmm. And uh, most, on average, based on I think our analysis, is ch um, the Chinese users on average spend more on the social medias. And there's a lot of what we call the data touch point, which really helps to train the model and the algorithm. And, uh, and also stuff, there's stuff like, the, the, for example, voice and the nat natural language. Because the Chinese language itself is very unique and specific, when it comes to, say, do the natural language processing, um, the Western companies cannot process or able to train the model. And therefore, you have all this advantage um, to, for China really to take a, a leapfrog on this area, being more innovative. But just watch out one thing is ethical and uh, privacy, right? When we're using this data and then make sure we, we really watch out for privacy and uh, being what we call the ethical um, consumerism. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure the audience has a few questions. I'd like to open this up. Yes, we have someone right here in the front. Hello, hello I'm from Economic Daily. Um, so in the 20 features, in the 20 years, sorry, yesterday I read at the WEF from 2018 to 2022, the impact of AI on job market. So can you give me a perspective for the future for the next four years, AI's impact on the job market in China. Question? Um, mm. This reporter was talking about, you know, the WEF also issued a, a report, mm. but it's for 2022. It's next four years, and how do we reconcile to? First of all, I haven't seen that report. I haven't seen that report. I don't know what's their actual projection. Okay. I don't know what's their actual projection. Sorry, the interpreters, can't, the interpreters can't hear. But it sounds like 75 that million. Issued this morning, so I haven't, yeah. haven't seen it. We've been busy with our own uh, report, but um, you know, I think in general, you know, I think the report is saying the same sort of things. There will be a positive net impact in jobs. Um, I think that in terms of the profile, what we expect from some of our research is that there will be a kind of S curve profile. So initially, the job impacts will be lower, and then uh, as we go through to the next sort of three, four years then it will begin to pick up through the 2020s and into the 2030s as some of these other technologies start to mature. So we wouldn't necessarily expect to see such big impacts over the next sort of three, four, five years. Uh, we'll see some, but they'll probably be of a smaller magnitude. But it will really be later in the 2020s and into the 2030s that we see the biggest impacts. That's, that's what our research is suggesting. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Did, did you understand that answer? You, uh, okay. yeah. We had the, the gentleman yeah. in the back. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm a reporter from Caixin. Uh, so could you put some color on the, the jobs of the future? I mean, uh, by the help of AI, maybe we'll see some uh, completely new uh, jobs uh, in, in the future. Uh, so uh, maybe you can give, give us some examples on that. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think there will be some completely new jobs, but by definition, it's hard for me to say what they are. I mean, if, if we went back 20 years and you'd said, well, uh, 
what would be a smartphone app developer. I wouldn't have known what you were talking about because we didn't have any smartphones or apps. So I think almost by definition, it's impossible to be specific about what the jobs, those kind of jobs will be. And I think those sort of jobs also, we did a previous study with uh, a professor from Oxford University looking at the new job creation over the last 20 years. Um, this was a few years ago, so it's 20 years before 2015. And we found only about 5% of UK jobs were totally new jobs, most of them in the digital area. You know, things around websites and smartphones and, and other sort of digital jobs. So it's a relatively small number of jobs, um, but high value, high paid jobs. But the most of the jobs we're talking about are extra jobs here are not new jobs of the future. They're actually existing types of jobs like healthcare worker, nurse, doctor, teacher, other sort of jobs in areas that are high demand and in a richer society, you can actually pay for more of those people. So for example, in healthcare, you know, you have a richer society, the government gets more tax revenues, the government can spend more on public health and education, and therefore you can employ more people. So it's not the case that the jobs of the future, in most cases, won't be that different from the jobs of today. Just in the richer society, you can afford you know, to pay for more people in the areas of high demand. Then there'll be a small number of these sort of AI-related or robot-related or drone-related jobs, which are very difficult to predict now what they will be because you know, by definition they're difficult, but will probably be quite small in number. So that's generally how we see things mapping out. I would just add to it. Um, Give you one example, for example, because um, I do a lot of financial services. AI is already taking place a lot of what we call the analyst job, right? Because typically for um, traditional analysts in the investment banking, you need, like you could probably read 10 analyst reports, you'll be so tired. Where the machine and the AI could read about 100 reports, no problem at all, right? So it replaced the analyst, but then you need those uh, programmers to design and write those codes for the AI to read those reports and uh, how to assess those reports. Similarly with the robot advisor, right? The robot advisor replaced the portfolio manager, but you need those programmers and uh, those who could design the robot advisor algorithm. So that's the new job of being created. Yeah. Mm. There were a couple of other hands. There was another question just over there. Hello, I'm from, good afternoon, I'm from China Economic Guideline. Um, that report is from a global view on the job market, but I'd like to have a personal view on the job market, some advice, for example, um, people, some people, the report said that journalists will be replaced by AI robots. Well, I don't, I don't know that journalists, I mean, to some extent, of course, some, some articles online are already written by AI systems in some routine aspects of financial reporting, sports reporting and other things. So that's already happened to a degree. But at the same time, I think there's always going to be room for journalists who have a point of view. So if you're a columnist, you know, with a certain point of view on something, I think the ability to sort of synthesize information from a large number of different sources and come up with a distinctive point of view written with flair, you know, is something that will always be needed. And I think that we're still a long way from AI systems that can do that. And also people ultimately, you know, if you're watching the news or something, you're wanting to watch someone with a certain amount of personality, you know, who, who brings their own sort of uh, point of view and their own uh, you know, intelligence to this. So I think while one could not say never, I think at least for the next, you know, the foreseeable future, I think there will be plenty of roles within media and the journalism for humans to fill. But I think it will be a matter of filling those roles where they can complement and add to the, uh, if you like, more routine uh, aspects that the AI systems can cover, uh, ra rather than necessarily being exactly the same as the jobs of the past. Maybe we have time for one more question. Okay, well seeing that, I'm gonna take this opportunity to ask one last thing from um, each of these gentlemen. If you guys could end on one sound bite that you would like us to take away from this report, what would it be? John, can we start with you? 
So firstly, don't be afraid of some shock stories you read about robots and AI taking away jobs because we think at least in China they will probably create at least as many and probably more jobs than they destroy. But at the same time, don't be complacent because there is a danger uh, that these things could also increase income inequality, could increase the gap between the digital elite and uh, ordinary people. And so I think there needs to be big investment by government, business and education in retraining, lifelong learning and in supporting for a stronger safety net those people who may find it hard to adjust to the new technologies. Okay. James? Yeah, so I think uh, it's like uh, any technology. Um, technology itself is neutral. Um, there's always good side and a bad side. And uh, the key is um, both from policy and the business perspective fully aware and uh, prepare for it. As I said before, trying to maximize the benefit and uh, minimize the harm. But only if you are fully aware and uh, prepare. Otherwise, you'll be caught. All right, so don't be afraid. But don't get complacent, um, is, I think it's a great place to end. Hopefully I'm going to take your advice to heart that moderators like myself will still be here Hi. even when we have AI. Hopefully you've enjoyed <laughs> this press conference. I would love to thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank John, I'd like to thank James. Thank you so much for sharing the report and your insights. Um, and thank you everyone for attending both here and online. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda.